Measuring is only one part of the process in leveling. Equally important are preventing mistakes, recording the readings, and computing results with confidence. I'm Todd Horton for the Illinois Professional Land Surveyors Association. In the previous video, you saw the basic pattern of measurements you, we use to find the elevation differences between points on the ground. Our survey started there on the left and ended over here on the right. However, this survey contains no checks. That is, if one measurement is wrong, then the whole survey will be wrong, and we won't even know that it's wrong. Well, perhaps you've heard the phrase, measure twice, cut once. It's a rule of thumb designed to prevent measurement blunders. Applied to leveling, it means that I'll measure the elevation difference proceeding from left to right, and measure it again by proceeding from right to left. Those two elevation differences should match very closely. If there's a large mismatch, then there's a blunder in my measurements. The forward run in my benchmark circuit produced an elevation difference of positive 2.79 feet. Well, that value is positive because the new benchmark elevation on the right is higher than the starting elevation you see over here on the left. By contrast, the reverse run yielded an elevation difference of negative 2.81 feet. It makes sense that this value is negative since the reverse run starts higher and ends lower. So the absolute value of these results differs by only 0.02 feet. That's a fairly small error for a survey of this type. Now why don't these two values match exactly? Because there is error in every measurement. As it applies to measurement, the term error does not mean mistake. A mistake really is a blunder. For instance, simply misreading the level rod is a blunder. However, the term error describes the natural random variation in repeated measurement results. If you measure something multiple times, it won't come out exactly the same every time. If you round your reading to the nearest one hundredth of a foot, that rounding is literally an error source. Sometimes you round up, sometimes you round down. If the level rod is not completely vertical at the time of reading, there will be a small error in the measurement. These and other error sources will largely, but not completely, cancel each other out. The remaining error at the end of our level circuit is called closure error. Now to compute closure error, we're going to subtract the known elevation from the calculated elevation at the benchmark where the level circuit ends, where you can see over here on the left. Starting with the forward run and it returning to the known benchmark on the reverse run, we calculated the ending elevation to be 842.15 feet. However, that benchmark already had a known elevation of 842.17 feet that you can see in parentheses at the left. Therefore, 842.15 feet minus 842.17 feet equals a negative 0.02 feet. That is, the level circuit closure error is negative 0.02 feet. For leveling, there is a standard format for field notes that tells the trained reader not only the measurements, but also the sequence of the measurement. The terms from the previous video, that is backsight, height of instrument, and foresight, form the structure in good field notes. Every measurement in our level circuit needs location information in order to be meaningful. The left column in the leveling notes is reserved for measurement location. In some types of surveying, the location is called a station. Well, here you can see the word station has been abbreviated to the letters STA. The next three columns will contain backsight readings, 
abbreviated as BS, heights of instrument, HI, and foresight readings, FS. The fifth column will contain elevations. Well, first, we'll set up our instrument where we can see the rod sitting atop the known benchmark. In the notes, we'll record the rod location, in this case, BM for benchmark, in the station column. Since the benchmark elevation is known, we'll record that in the elevation column. Our first rod reading is 4.69 feet. Since this reading is taken on a point of known elevation, we call it a backsight. Since the backsight reading was taken with a rod atop the benchmark, we'll record 4.69 feet in the backsight column on the benchmark row. Armed with this information, we now have sufficient data to compute the height of instrument. Since the line of sight is above the point where the rod sits, we'll add the backsight reading to the elevation. At this instrument setup, 4.69 plus 842.17 equals 848.86 feet. We'll record that result in the HI column in the next row down the page. When the backside reading has been recorded, the rod person moves beyond the instrument operator to create a turning point. We'll start a new line below the one containing our first HI, labeling it TP1 for turning point 1. With the rod atop the first turning point, the instrument operator reads 6.08 feet for the first foresight. In the new TP1 line, we'll record 6.08 in the foresight column. Turning point 1 is physically below the instrument line of sight, which has an elevation we call the height of instrument. For this setup, the HI, as we said a moment ago, is 848.86 feet. Therefore, 848.86 feet minus 6.08 feet, the foresight reading, equals 840.78 feet. This is the elevation of turning point one, and we'll record that in the elevation column on the turning point one line. Now that turning point one has a known elevation, the instrument operator will pick up the instrument, move beyond the turning point, and set up again. The first reading, as we call it, the first shot, is a backsight to turning point one. Notice here that we'll record that reading in the backsight column on the turning point one line. With that information, we compute a new HI. Next, the rod person moves forward, sets a new turning point, TP2. After reading and recording the foresight on turning point two, we now have enough information to compute the elevation at TP2. Have you seen a pattern in the field notes so far? The readings and the math follow a repeating sequence back and forth down the page. Plus, the location of any number within the grid identifies that number. For instance, we know that this reading was a backsight on turning point one. Why? Because it is in the backsight column on the turning point one row. This HI corresponds to the setup between the benchmark and turning point one. As the level circuit progresses, the field process and note keeping advance in this pattern. The backsight comes first, the rod person moves forward and sets a turning point, then comes the foresight. After the foresight, the rod person stays put while the instrument operator moves forward, resets the instrument, and repeats the process. In this type of level circuit, there will always be one backsight and one foresight for each setup. The number of HIs in the notes tells us the number of setups in the survey. At the end of the forward run to our new benchmark, we have effectively measured once. That is, we measured the elevation difference between the known benchmark and the new benchmark going forward. But we haven't yet proven 
that our measurements are reliable. Therefore, we'll measure the same elevation difference again, but now in the opposite direction. So far in this video, you've seen the computation for HIs and elevations appearing conveniently with the readings. In real life, it's best to simply record the readings in the field without computing the HIs and elevations as you go. Then, when all the measurements are done, sit down and do all the math at once. You'll make fewer mistakes when you follow this rule of thumb. Here's how the process will look. On our reverse run, we'll simply record back sights and foresights, saving the computations for later. With the instrument in a new location, we'll take a back sight on the new benchmark, recording it in the appropriate row in the back sight column. Then, going back to turning point four, we'll take a foresight reading there. Without computing the HIR elevation, we'll move forward. Notice that just as before, our field note entries alternate back and forth as you move down the page. Now with the forward and reverse runs complete, we say that we have closed the level circuit. This circuit started and ended at the same point. It closed where it began. So now let's finish the circuit computations. For the forward run, we already calculated the new benchmark elevation. So let's add the next backsight reading to that elevation to get the HI between the new benchmark and turning point four. Next, we'll subtract the next foresight on turning point four to find the elevation on turning point four again. Now notice that our notes continue in the upper right corner of the screen here. Notice that below the new TP4 elevation is another number in parentheses. The parentheses around this number indicate that this is a previously determined value. In fact, it is the value we computed from the forward run of the circuit. This shows us then that we have small errors accumulating in our readings. This is a natural consequence of things like rounding our rod readings to the hundredth of a foot. This type of check helps us find rod reading errors and math errors. So be sure to compare the elevations from your forward and reverse runs. The computation process continues until we reach the end of the circuit. Here you can see that the two final elevations, that is original and computed, for the known benchmark differ by 0.02 feet or two one hundredths of a foot. This is the closure error in the circuit. Well, these numbers look good so far, but we haven't yet proven them to be reliable. We now need to check our arithmetic. It's very easy to blunder simple math, so we'll perform an independent arithmetic check. First, sum up all the foresight readings. In our case, they sum up to 56.99 feet. Then, sum up all the backsight readings. Here, they sum up to 57.01 feet. To complete the arithmetic check, we have a simple sequence. To the starting elevation, that is the elevation of our known benchmark, let's add the backsight sum and subtract the foresight sum. This result should match the ending elevation you computed in the tabular field notes. If these numbers don't match, then there is a computation blunder somewhere in the process. When that happens, carefully recompute your work until you find and correct the mistake. Equipped with these methods for preventing mistakes and checking your work, you're ready to move forward into more common level circuits. In the next video, we'll explore how to use profile level circuits for mapping surveys. I'm Todd Horton for the Illinois Professional Land Surveyors Association.